Before we get started, please don't forget to rate and review wherever possible. It really helps our podcast find the ears of listeners just like you. Also, if you have a story to tell, don't forget to submit it via email at contact at campfirecoldpod.com or leave a voicemail message at 720-297-8608. You can also follow us anywhere socially at Campfire Cult Pod and visit us online at campfirecultpod.com. Listener to the Campfire Cult Podcast. From a camper van deep in the haunted woods, I bring you first-hand accounts of chilling encounters with the paranormal. Step into the night and take a peek into the realm where reality and the supernatural collide. My name is Jazz, and I'll be your host. Welcome back, campers. Tonight we're headed into the haunted forest where dark entities lurk and the adventurous go missing. In our first story of the evening, we find ourselves on an isolated road in Tioga County, Pennsylvania, where a man's journey takes a terrifying turn. I was driving home on an isolated road through a mountainous area. It was late and dark, and I honestly couldn't have told you exactly where I was. All I knew was that I was in Tioga County, Pennsylvania, and that I needed to stay on the road I was on until I finally left the state and hit my home territory in New York. I was in and out of a daydream state. You know how it is when you're exhausted and trying to push on. I was so exhausted that even the caffeine wasn't giving me what I needed, and I was too cheap to spend the money on a hotel. However, when I was approaching a curve, this is where my story occurs. My headlights lit up something that looked like a person except almost double, if not triple, in size. I had to swerve to avoid it, and I sure as hell woke up from that. I wasn't sure if I had clipped him or her, but my car started sliding and went into a ditch. The first thing I did was get out to make sure that I hadn't just hit somebody. I was thinking, why would there be somebody out here in the middle of nowhere wearing all black? There was no one around and was pretty sure that there had been somebody on the road. I was certain of it. My car was good and stuck. The tires wouldn't grip the mud. I didn't want to call for a tow truck, but it was looking like my only option. I sat in my car and tried phoning out when I was sure I had seen movement. I was hoping it was someone willing to help me, but then thought it was just my exhaustion playing tricks on me. I shook my head, wondering if it would be a good idea just to sleep right there in the ditch and wait for the tow truck. Then it started to rain heavily. I was really tired and the sound of the rain wasn't helping me stay awake and the thoughts of sleep were suddenly gone when the driver's side window was blocked by the drenched furry body of something very large. It was walking on two legs, but there was no way that this was a human. It stopped, then peered into the window. It was so ugly and evil looking that it's the only description that I feel is even appropriate. It was pointing its long wolf-like snout right at me and baring its teeth in a menacing grin like it was smiling at me as if it was happy that I was trapped in this little metal enclosure. Those long yellow fangs, but the worst part was its eyes. There was no soul in them, but they had a supernatural glow. It then ran its claw on my window, which made a scratching sound. It was so sadistic, so evil. It maintained a stare and a grin like it was letting me know that there was no way I can run. I then noticed another wolf-like creature come out from the downpour, and then another. I don't know how many there were, but I was paralyzed with fear. It seemed like forever, though it was only a matter of seconds, but then they instantly disappeared. I looked around hoping that they were gone and then I wondered why they took off. I soon found out. A pickup truck pulled up behind me. The old man stepped out, walked up to my driver's side window and volunteered to pull me out of the ditch. He looked at me and asked if I was all right, but I didn't tell him what I had seen. He hooked a chain to my car and quickly pulled it out of the ditch. I thanked him profusely and offered to pay him for his trouble. He refused any payment. 
I then felt comfortable enough to tell him what had happened to me and that I had never seen anything like it before. After I described what I had seen, he got a strange look on his face, almost like he had heard this before. I asked him questions, but he was very dismissive. I was positive that he was aware of the beasts. That was in November 2020. I'll never forget it. I can only imagine what may have happened to me if that old man had not come to my rescue. Next, at a remote lakefront cabin, a group of high school friends has an encounter that changes them forever. My story involves myself and three of my really good friends throughout my whole childhood, Kevin, Ryan, and Tommy, whom I am good friends with to this day. During midsummer, usually around the middle of July, we always made time to go up to my friend's family cabin way up north in the forest of Minnesota to Vermilion Lake. Throughout all of our younger years, we would always go, accompanied by my friend Kevin's dad, who owned the cabin, and sometimes a few of our dads as well. Once we were juniors in high school, we were old enough to go to the cabin on our own, finally, without Kevin's dad or any other adult supervision. I would like to mention a little information in regards to my friend's cabin to help you picture the scenario. My friend's cabin is very remote and on a very large-sized island. Other cabins were on the island, but the next one closest to us was a solid quarter or half mile away at least, which you could get to by taking a man-made path around the island. I want to mention that to get to my friend's cabin, you had to park on a gravel road on the opposite side of the island and take his boat across the lake about a half mile. By the way, this lake is huge. My mind had a tendency to wander when sleeping there. It was all one level with only two bedrooms next to one another, a kitchen and connected living room, and a bathroom in the back of the cabin. There was at least one window in each room with no curtains at all, so it was very easy to see outside to the woods and lake. And this is where my mind would wander, as I always thought someone was peering in. Of course, nobody ever was. I had been to this cabin a dozen times throughout my life and nothing had ever happened, and the older I got, the easier it was to sleep. Now for the event. On the third night during the trip, when we were there on our own finally, we had set up a campfire and been drinking beer all night. We went out to his dock to gaze up at all the stars and enjoy our buzz when all of a sudden we heard something out at the water that sounded like a fish jumping out to catch a bug. We quickly looked out at the lake with curiosity, wondering where the splash came because we had our poles ready 24-7. Thankfully, the moon was out that night, which helped light up the lake. Otherwise, it would be pitch black with no city lights for miles, and we would not have been able to see anything on the lake. My friend Ryan began to point, saying, Um, what the hell is that? After looking closely and finally spotting what he was pointing at, all I can describe was it simply looked like a head in the middle of the lake, just floating about, staring at us. It was about 80 yards from the dock. There is no question that I could see its features. It had long black hair and very pale skin on the face, but I couldn't make out the eyes, mouth, nose, or chin as if it was just a blob of pale skin with long black hair over it. I'll never forget the feeling that came over me. The hairs on my legs, neck, arm all stood up, and I was paralyzed on the inside, ready to leave that moment. But we told ourselves it was just a loon, as these birds are very popular night drifters on the lake and do their hunting late, and also have black with white colors on their coats and hunt by diving deep into the water, holding their breath up to five minutes sometimes. So it was possible that a loon all of a sudden popped up in the water after hunting a bit, or at least we tried to talk ourselves into that scenario. All of us getting the creeps, we decided to go back to our campfire, lit it even brighter, and headed inside to drink more. I would like to mention that there were stairs outside the cabin, about eight stairs in total, that went down to the ground where the fire pit and dock were. We soon forgot about the head with the help of the beer, but I had to use the bathroom really bad, and the one inside was occupied. I went outside to do my business since we were in the great outdoors. 
When I was peeing and glancing out at the beautiful moonlit lake, I noticed that the black circle object was still there, but about 30 yards closer and still looking as if it was staring right at me. I could easily see the nose on this thing's face. Again, it was very pale, like it hadn't seen the sun for years. A very, very uneasy feeling came over me, and I immediately went inside, told my other friends to come look quick, and we all went outside to see if it was still there. Well, it was. Nobody dared go down to the dock anymore that night, and we immediately went back inside, ruling out that it probably wasn't a loon, because a loon wouldn't have tread the water in the same spot. The current should have drifted it somewhere else. For a loon to stay in the same spot for almost an hour or two made no sense to any of us. This head-like object was stiff as a board and not moving a single muscle, just staring up at us. There was no ripple made at all from the object. We decided it was just a log and went back in. I could tell everyone felt uneasy though. A few hours passed, it was super late into the night and we needed sleep. Being curious, I looked back outside once more, and the black object had completely vanished. I couldn't help but feel a sense of relief, thinking the log must have floated off or just hit shore somewhere. We slept with the windows open. Me and my buddy, Tommy, slept in the living room while my two other friends slept in the two separate bedrooms. Not being able to sleep, but keeping my eyes shut, I began to hear someone walking around outside at the bottom of the stairs to the cabin. I thought I was about to shit bricks. No question that what I heard was now on the dock and pacing back and forth as it made the sound of boots on wood. It was as if they weren't sure what to do with themselves. It lasted for about three minutes. Wanting to whisper to my buddy, but frozen in fear, I just kept my eyes shut and ears on full alert. The footsteps sounded like they took two steps up the deck stairs all of a sudden, but then turned around and sounded like they were sprinting out down the man-made path. After it sounded like the steps were long gone and a couple of minutes had passed, I woke up Tommy asking if he heard the steps. I was startled to see my friend Ryan walking out of his room and saying, We need to leave. Now! Something was very disturbing about his expression, and I asked him, Why? He woke up my other friend, Kevin, in the other room and said, Let's go, get to the boat. It's time to go. Asking him, What? What? Ryan, what the hell is wrong with you? He explained to us quickly while grabbing his stuff, and I will never forget what he said. He said when he was turning onto his side in his bed to get more comfortable, he saw someone peeking in at the top right corner of his window. Once it noticed him noticing it, it quickly shifted out of his view. He said all he saw was one eye, ghostly white skin, and black long hair. Another thing I would like to add. When we look back at what he experienced, we realize that since the face was in the top right corner of the window, this thing was either damn near eight feet tall, standing on a ladder, or was somehow floating. Ryan then continued to say, seriously, let's fucking go. Absolutely disturbed out of my mind and feeling like I was going to be sick, we all agreed to leave. We packed our stuff and booked it out of there, fast. We locked up, and as we headed down the stairs, we saw barefoot prints in the dirt heading off into the path and all around the cabin. We picked up our pace, getting to the boat in seconds, threw our stuff in, and sped off. I don't even remember untying the boat from the dock. My eyes were glued to the island, trying to spot anything moving, but I saw nothing. Thankfully, I didn't even think to look for the floating head in the water. When we had finally gotten our stuff packed in the car and boat tied up, we hopped in the car and took off. We had been driving out about 10 miles, and out of the blue, Ryan all of a sudden broke down in the car sobbing, saying, What was it, guys? Oh, fuck. What did I see? It was late about four or five in the morning, but no one slept. It was a very quiet ride home. My friend's dad, who owns the cabin, went up that following weekend and said he experienced nothing while there, but did mention barefoot prints were still all around the cabin. 
which he thought odd because it had rained a few times and should have washed away. This made him uneasy. Whatever my one friend saw in the window really hit him hard, though. After his breakdown, he had trouble sleeping and ended up having to seek some help for a couple of weeks and got on some sleeping medicine. As time went on, he ended up being fine but isn't comfortable sleeping next to a window without a curtain anymore. I, to this day, cannot explain what happened and why it happened to us. I can't explain what I saw in the lake and what Ryan saw in his window. Nothing has ever happened at that cabin since that night, according to my friend's dad. I personally have never gone back to the cabin, which really makes me sad because I had great childhood memories there. Tommy and Kevin both have gone back and had been fine, but Ryan refuses to go back. A lot of people have cabins on this island, so it could have been a prank or something worse. I will never be able to explain what was floating in the lake, but the fact that this incident along with the footprints and someone looking in at Ryan all happened in the same night seems like more than a coincidence. Coming up, a man living in the remote and peaceful small town of Indian Mound, Tennessee, finds his life turned upside down by a visitor in the night. I was in my last year before retiring from the army and was going through a divorce. My soon-to-be ex went back to Texas with my two girls, and I planned to move closer to them once my retirement was official. I rented a small two-bedroom in a town called Indian Mound in Tennessee. Indian Mound was out of the way and really isolated. My commute sucked, but it was cheap and peaceful. I had no neighbors, and across the street was all conservation land for miles. On one side and around the back of the property was a swamp. On the other side, the closest house was out of shouting distance. I enjoyed living there initially. Before this, I lived in the suburbs, and all the noise, people, and traffic drove me crazy. One night I came home around one in the morning from a concert in Nashville. It was early spring and it was somewhat foggy out. The driveway dipped down and the house was about an eighth mile from the road. As I pulled in, I saw a huge black dog standing in the front yard. Looked like a black lab, or lab mixed breed. It stood with its head up and its tail straight up. It was fixed on me. I slowly pulled my car up, unsure what to do next when it turned and ran into the swamp. I didn't think much of it and went inside. Over the following few months, things started happening at night. I would always wake up around three or so in the morning, thinking I heard voices outside my window, and sometimes it sounded like someone or a couple of people were whispering to each other, but I couldn't understand what they were saying. Sometimes I would hear footsteps and movement outside. I thought it was maybe a deer or that dog, but when I looked out, I saw nothing. This type of shit continued for months. One night I woke up to a noise and saw it was 2.57. A bright white light shone through the porch glass doors. I ran out into the kitchen and looked through the small sink window, and it looked like someone was out in the swamp shining a spotlight. It was one of those high-powered lights used in search and rescue. It was blinding and lit up the whole kitchen. I opened the back doors and ran out onto the porch, yelling that I was calling the cops. The light went out and I heard someone moving away from the house through the swamp. Cops came out and took a report and told me to ensure my doors were locked and to call if anything else happened. I was hypervigilant for the next few days. I checked behind me when I was coming and going and always slept with the shades drawn and doors locked. The footsteps around the house continued and some nights I thought I could hear a dog panting outside my window, although I never found tracks or saw signs of an animal in the morning. Things died down after a while and I was about three months away from the end of my lease. I woke up around three in the morning, scared out of my mind. I was sleeping and heard a woman calling my name in my dream. I opened my eyes and realized it wasn't a dream when I heard the voice call my name again, clear as day, and I was awake. I shot up out of bed and turned on the lights. I checked in the closet and under the bed. I opened the bedroom door and listened out in the hallway. I couldn't hear anything and was about to cut the lights and go back to bed when someone started pounding on my front door. I nearly jumped out of my skin. It was like someone was bashing the door with a sledgehammer. I yelled out that I had a gun and to get the fuck off my property. I said I called the cops and I'll blow your fucking head off before they get here. 
The pounding stopped. Cops came out again and took another report. There was no visible damage to the door or footprints around the property. It all just stopped after that. I did buy a handgun, but the rest of my time renting there was without incident. I'm back in Texas in an apartment complex in the Burbs, and I don't mind. The backwoods of Tennessee were a creepy place, and I'm happy to be out of there. Up next, we're staying in Tennessee where a family is tormented by a mimicking predator in the night. About a year ago, I moved my family and I to a home way out in the woods in Tennessee. The nights here can be extremely loud. Between the crickets, the tree frogs, and the cicadas, it can almost be deafening. One night, not too long after we moved in, I had forgotten something in my car and headed outside to get it. The first thing that struck me as odd was that my dog wouldn't go outside with me. My dog goes everywhere with me, as I am her whole world. But not this night. As I held the door open, she looked out, then looked up at me like, nope, I'm not doing that. So I walked out and shut the door behind me. The second thing that caught me off guard was that there was not a sound, it was dead silent. Still shrugged this off and walked down my front steps and headed down to my car. When I had gotten about 10 feet from my car, the hairs on the back of my neck stood up. I felt as though something was watching me. I looked around but saw nothing. After I reached in my car for what I had forgotten to grab earlier, I had this feeling like something was moving towards me. I took a step back and checked around me. All of a sudden, I heard one of my hedges next to me that lined the walkway to our front door rattle. At first, I thought it was a rabbit that I had spooked, as I had seen one just earlier in the day right where this was. A few seconds later, I heard the sound of a large rock, about the size of a cantaloupe, landing a few feet away from me. It hit the walkway and bounced into a shrub. I typically carry for safety reasons and drew my gun. Then I called out, whoever is out there is about to be shot. After a few seconds of nothing, I began to think that maybe this was some local teenagers messing with the new people. I holstered my sidearm, turned and started walking back to my front door. Almost as soon as I turned towards my house, I heard this deep panting sound. It sounded like a huge dog, but what made me run back to my front door was that it sounded like it was right behind me. I leaped up onto my porch, turned and drew my gun again, expecting something right there, but again, there was nothing. A couple weeks later, I was on my porch at night, sitting on a bench with my husband. He got up and walked inside to get something, and as soon as he shut the door, I heard that panting sound again. I couldn't see anything, yet this sounded like it was right on top of me. The sound was coming from everywhere, and it was very loud. Again, I couldn't see anything, so I headed back inside. Now at this point, I was questioning moving here, but after nothing else really happening, I let it go. A month or so later, it was a really rainy and stormy night. This is around 9 p.m., and my husband and I enjoy listening to the rain and talking about how relaxing the rain is. Growing up in Oregon, I loved the rain, and for the past 10 years, we lived in Vegas, where it would dump the entire year of rain in a day, then be bone dry for the rest of the year. For my husband, who grew up in Nevada, rain was such a rare thing, he loved going outside and watching it. So for us, this is an enjoyable experience. Except this night in particular, things took a weird turn. As we were sitting there talking about the rain and relaxing, my husband stops me and said, did you hear that? I said, no, what did you hear? He said, I swear it sounded like a small child calling for help out in the woods beside our house. I said, no, I didn't hear anything. After a few moments of us listening intently, he said, there it is again. I said, I didn't hear a thing, sweetie. Are you sure you're not just hearing things? He looked at me shocked that I didn't hear anything and said, no, I'm positive. How could you not hear that? It was our son. I think he's out there and got lost. I said, no, he's in the house sleeping on the couch. We then both looked through the blinds that were open right behind us and we could see all of our children laying there. He said, that's so weird. I swear it sounds like our son. I said, well, it isn't him, he's right there. Besides, I don't hear anything. He then stands up and says, wow, he's really crying out for help. I need to go look for him. I grabbed his hand and said, I have been listening and there is absolutely nobody calling out for help. You need to stay here. At this point, I am getting worried about him. He then says, what if there is some child out there lost in the woods? I said, well, first off, I would be able to hear them too. 
Secondly, there are no other kids around here for miles, and the odds of them being lost a hundred feet from our house that's lit up like a Christmas tree is nil. He then says, I know, but what if it's a kid? Before I could say anything else, he stands up and starts walking toward the stairs. I jumped up and grabbed his hand and said, no, you're not, get in the house. I don't know what's going on, but you need to go inside. He then complies and we both go inside. I didn't know what this was, but it freaked me out. A few months after this, just as it was getting dark outside, I heard the front door to our house open and I got up to investigate. We have autistic six-year-old twins and we have the door set up so that they can't open it without us there. So to hear this sound, it could only be my husband. What was weird was the fact that he usually doesn't go outside without saying something to me. I walked out front and saw my husband walking down our private road towards the drive on the side of our house. I ask him what he is doing, and he says he was sitting on the back patio and kept hearing a baby crying out in the woods. I said, seriously? And you just decided to walk off into the woods to investigate? He then looks out into the woods and says, see, there it is again. Again, I can't hear anything, but what I did notice is that it was completely silent out again. I told him, just like before, the chances of a baby being out in the woods outside our house is slim and that he needed to get back in the house. He said, what if someone left a baby out there? I said, well, if that were true, I would hear it too. Now at this point, I was really starting to worry about my husband's mental health. I actually asked him to see a psychiatrist and he did. Now looking back, I feel really bad about this knowing what I know. A few days later, we are out front on the porch. It's early evening. Our three-year-old son was riding around on his little car in front of the house. Now he knows that he is not allowed outside of a certain area that we mapped off. He loves playing outside, but with the road behind 50 feet from our front porch, we have to be careful, as a lot of boaters will fly through after drinking all day on their boats. As we are talking, we are both keeping an eye on him. A neighbor drives by and stops to say hi for a second. This interaction took approximately eight seconds, as all they said was, how are things? We said good, and he told us he would stop by later. His wife got something for the kids, who happens to be one of their teachers in school, and we said, Okay, great. And he drove off. I looked over where our son was and he was gone. I called out his name and ran over to the side of the house and could hear his car on our side drive. I scolded him for leaving the area and he said something in his three-year-old gibberish and pointed to the woods behind our house. I said he had five seconds to get back up to the front of the house or else. He adamantly pointed back in the direction of the woods and kept trying to tell me something. I looked off in the direction of the woods and just assumed he saw a deer or squirrel or something and wanted to see it up close. I walked him back up to the front of the house and he cried the whole way there. He got really upset that I wouldn't let him go into the woods, but I just wrote this off as him being curious and most three-year-old boys are. Now this instance isn't isolated as our twins have done similar things, but nothing quite as extreme as this. There have been nights where we had just laid down for the night and heard a loud bang on the side of our house on the wall behind our bed. It was so loud that I jumped up and looked out the window. Our floodlight had come on, but I could see nothing. Now the weird part about this is that our bedroom sits about 12 feet from the ground level, as we have a full-sized basement that's cinder block. I put on my slippers and walked outside to investigate. It was dead silent again. The floodlight that's on the side of the house had clicked off at this point, so I walked over to the end of the deck and shined my light around the yard. There was nothing. I walked around the house and shined the light around intently. As I approached the back side of my house, the hairs on the back of my neck stood up. It felt like someone was watching me. I shined the light up in the trees, but again, nothing. I rounded the corner and the first thing I noticed was that my three dogs that were in their area weren't making a peep. Our dogs have no filter and will bark at anyone and everyone. This includes me. So to see them all hiding with their tails between their legs, not making a peep, really had me worried. As I kept walking, all of a sudden, the crickets and frogs started making sounds again. It was as if someone had clicked a switch. I walked back into the house. Due to the circumstances that night, I decided to let the dogs in and sleep with us. This very same thing has happened on all four exterior walls of our house. It's random and annoying, but just like this instance, every time there is nothing going on outside. There have also been times where we were sitting in the house, and as I was watching a movie, my husband walked over to me and said, did you call me? I said no, and he said he swears he heard me call his name in his ear. He said that it was definitely my voice, but he didn't understand because it sounded so close, 
and I was a good 20 feet away from him in my recliner. The important part of this was that he was sitting at the table doing something, and the slider to the backyard was open behind him. Our back patio sits about 20 feet off the ground and is like a balcony, as it has no stair access outside. I think the previous owner built it for barbecuing. There have been several instances where he would say he heard someone whisper in his ear, but he couldn't make out the sound. Again, I kept thinking he was going crazy, but as you will see, I think all of this is tied into this final moment where things are revealed. The last thing I want to mention before we get into what just happened is that we have a shooting range built behind the workshop on the opposite side of our property next to the main road. It is kind of on a downslope, but it works perfectly for what we need it for. The range itself is cut straight into the woods going down about 100 yards or so. When you're at the downrange, you have woods surrounding you on all sides except back up to the shop. I have to say, it has always felt creepy when I'm out there alone. When you are down there, it feels like you're miles from anyone. One day around five in the evening, I was hanging out on the range. The sun was still up but was going to start to fade soon, so I knew I should be heading in soon. Up until this point, nothing really happened, other than this feeling of uneasiness. I kept getting this feeling like someone or something was watching me. I looked around but didn't see anything. Then I heard something big off to the side of me. It sounded like a large branch had snapped off a tree. Now, if you have been in Tennessee woods, you will know that a lot of branches fall off of trees randomly out of nowhere. So this is nothing new. Except this time, it was very loud and sounded like fresh, strong wood, if that makes any sense. I turned and looked, but again, couldn't see anything. Then I swear I heard someone right behind me. I turned around, but again saw nothing. As I started to walk again, I heard this deep growl. It was really deep and loud. And what's worse is that it was all around me. I turned around facing the range and started walking backward. The thought of some rabid dog charging out of the bushes had me freaked out, so running wasn't a good idea. I slowly walked backward up the hill, but nothing happened. I never told my husband about this as I didn't want him to freak out and go charging into the woods. Fast forward about a year later from when we moved in, and my niece is staying with us as a live-in nanny to earn money over summer break from college. We were on our way back from the store, and about a mile from our house, I saw two eyes reflecting in the headlights coming from a wide tree on the side of the road just ahead. It had caught my attention because they were higher than a deer, but a different color and size. Just as I had said, what is that? And squinted, they vanished. I had made a comment that it was almost as if it had known I could see its eyes and moved. The color was kind of a golden green, but they resembled the mannerism of a large cat as they felt ominous. It's hard to explain, but I shrugged it off as we were passing the tree and saw nothing. A few moments later, we arrived at the house. As we were getting bags out of the car, my three-year-old son came bolting out of the house, excited to see me. As I was waiting to help her carry in her bags, I heard my dog growl. I turned around and she was looking at my neighbor's property across the street. What I saw has kept me up at night. Up until this point, I have always been skeptical as I had never seen anything with my own two eyes. Even with what had happened to me the year prior, I still had my doubts that it was just my mind playing tricks on me. My street is kind of a spread out neighborhood. Each house sits on several acres, and at the end of our road is Kentucky Lake. My neighbor's house sits adjacent to my house on about an acre lot. Directly in front of my house is a wall of woods, and directly behind my house is several thousand acres of untouched forest. As I was looking across the street to my neighbor's property, I saw a large, dark figure between the trees. The movement caught me off guard as it looked like something big moving quickly on all fours. Then when it came out into clear view, it stood up and walked like a man. At first, I didn't know what to make of it. It was very tall, but what was strange about it was the distance it was covering and the fact that when it was in front of his shed, I swear I could see through it. It was clearly walking quickly, but moving faster than any person could at a sprint. More importantly, there was no sound. It was like it was phasing in and out of reality as it moved. I said, what the hell is that? And realized that it was looking directly at us. It had moved at an angle away from us to minimize its time out in the open and moving quickly as it could while still being silent. The hairs on the back of my neck stood up as I realized that whatever it was was stalking us. 
I told my niece to get in the house now, and I grabbed my son and booked it inside. I grabbed my gun and came back outside to see my niece still grabbing stuff out of her car. As she was slowly walking, she turned towards the woods across the street from my house and suddenly bolted for the house. She ran up the steps in a panic. I asked her what she saw and her face was pale as a ghost. She said, I heard something big in the woods walking loudly on the leaves and when I turned toward it, I heard a deep guttural growl. As she was walking down the walkway, I heard the sound of dry leaves crunching in the woods across the street. I told her to stop and come take the flashlight. Now at this point, she's about six feet away from our SUV. As she turned and started walking back to me, I caught a glimpse of something gray and hairy, bolt from behind the SUV back across the street into the woods. My porch is a raised porch, and our SUV is about six and a half feet tall. And whatever this was, it cleared about 45 feet in what looked like a single jump. It moved like lightning. Whatever it was, it wanted my niece. It jumped behind the car out of my line of sight and was waiting for her. She still doubted my warnings and grabbed the flashlight and walked back toward the car. As she entered my driveway, she stopped dead in her tracks, leaned forward as if she could see something. I asked her what she saw. She turned and ran back up on the porch with a terrified look on her face saying, nope, 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 over and over again. She said it was a figure hiding inside of a trees and she saw its eyes. I asked her what they looked like and all she could say was that they looked dull red at first, but as she got closer, they looked dead. I said, what do you mean dead? And she said that where the pupils were looked gray, like the way eyes look when they go blind. She said it was really dark gray and she swears she could see through it almost like a dark cloud. She wanted to go out again to get confirmation and took a step down the stairs. As she did, it revealed itself from the trees again. I said, let's get inside. And we went in and locked the door. It looked like a really tall human shaped being. The next morning, we did a height comparison to the tree limb she saw it stand over, and it put its height to around nine feet tall, and its eyes were about six inches apart. At this point, I don't know what this thing was. After doing some research, I think this thing was a predator type of creature, or what's called a glimmer man. I looked to see if there had been any other sightings in Benton County, but found nothing. In our final story of the evening, we're headed into the rugged terrain of central Idaho, where a man is guided by a mysterious stranger. It was September in central Idaho. Autumn had come to the mountains, and with it, bow hunters looking for mountain goats. My cousin, let's call him Vern for anonymity's sake, is an avid hunter. He's been all over North America hunting various game. Bears in Alaska, wild hogs in Texas, bighorn sheep in Wyoming. But his favorite hunting area was the Lemhi Mountain Range in central Idaho. Our extended family has been hunting in those mountains for generations. We know every river bottom and mountain peak like many people know their own neighborhoods. Mountain goats are a fascinating animal to hunt. They live well above the tree line in rocky environments. They are sure-footed and can climb near vertical slopes. Hunting these animals requires one to venture into these dangerous areas. You have to be mindful as you pursue an animal like that. One wrong step on a rocky slope or one loose rock could mean you're not going home ever again. Vern was an expert mountain hunter. It's something he was born to do. Vern decided to hunt in the Hayden River area of the Lemhees. It's a familiar spot to most locals, and the area is home to plenty of mountain goats. The first mile of Vern's hike was uneventful as he climbed up the canyon. The air was crisp, and his breath formed in great plumes as he progressed. The sun was just peeking over the mountains when Vern came to a small deer trail. He decided it might be a nice shortcut from his usual route and took it. A few hundred feet up the trail, he saw something odd pop out from behind a tree. It was a man. He was dressed in a light denim coat and jeans and was carrying a small backpack. My cousin stopped for a second to get his bearings, unsure of where this guy came from. The man waved at him with both arms. One of them was holding an older style hunting bow. Acknowledging him, Vern waved back. Although the man looked to be physically fine, it was clear he was emotionally distressed. He yelled out something my cousin couldn't quite hear and waved his arm, indicating my cousin should follow him. 
Vern didn't get any bad vibes from this man and could tell he was genuinely in need of some help. He began to make his way up the canyon, following this mystery man. Vern could never gain any ground on this guy. He was always just far enough away that he couldn't talk to him. Periodically, the man would stop, turn towards him to make sure Vern was still following. Every time he looked back, Vern could see the worry in his face. My cousin did his best to remain calm and keep a smile on his face, unsure who or what he was being led to. It was peculiar, Vern thought as he hiked. He hadn't seen any other vehicles on his drive up to the trailhead. Perhaps he came in from over another ridge? What could he possibly be leading him to? He figured one of his hunting party had been hurt and needed help. Of course, he wouldn't have had to speculate if the man would just stop and talk to him for five minutes. Vern lost sight of the guy just past a turn in the trail. The trail opened up into an incredibly steep, rocky talus slope. He looked in every direction and could not locate the man when he heard a whistle. Looking up, he saw the guy about 500 feet up the rocky slope, waving at him. There was no possible way he could have gotten up that far in just the short time Vern lost sight of him. He still didn't feel any fear or weariness about this weird situation. The man was waving more frantically now, practically begging Vern to follow him up the slope. With a sigh and a grunt, he started up the rocks. It was slow going. Every other step caused a mini rock slide and would cause him to continually lose his footing. Huffing and puffing on the cool, thin air, my cousin eventually made it to a small landing. It had taken him almost 45 minutes to get to that spot where he saw the man from below. There was no earthly way anyone could have done that scramble uphill any faster. Totally exhausted and out of breath, Vern sat down on the stone landing. He looked around and couldn't see the man anywhere. As he scanned his surroundings, he saw something odd poking out of a boulder about 20 feet away from him. Walking over to it, he found a weathered boot. Two boots, actually. Inside those boots, and under the boulder as well, were bones. Vern looked around once again for the man, but he never saw him again. Instead of feeling eerie or unnerving, Vern felt a sense of relief wash over him. These emotions weren't his own. What he felt seemed to come from all around him. He marked the spot with his GPS and decided to make his way down and call the authorities. The Limhi County Sheriff's Office responded and he led them up the canyon to the body. It took four grown men to push the boulder out of the way, and when they did, they found the skeletonized remains of a man. On the body, they found hunting equipment and some personal effects. From a credit card in the wallet, they were able to identify the man. He was a bow hunter that had gone missing almost exactly 53 years beforehand. Vern never wanted to be identified to the public or the missing hunter's family. He didn't want recognition for something like that. To him, it was just one of those bizarre mountain stories. He was happy that the family got closure, even if it was half a century later. The only thing that bothered him was the man leading him up the canyon and with his strange and sudden disappearance. He had mentioned the waving man to the sheriff, but was brushed off. When news reports came out announcing the discovery, several photos of the man were published. Vern was absolutely shocked when he saw them. In the photos was the man he had seen leading him up the mountain to the body. It finally made sense to him, the man's distressful look. The constant checking if Vern was following him. The sense of relief he felt when the body was discovered. That man was desperate to get home, and through Vern, he was able to be reunited with his family. Looks like that's all for tonight, dear listeners. Until next time, I'll be leaving you in the dark where whispers linger and shadows dance. Stay wary, sleep well, and beware the whispers in the night.
If you have a story to tell, please reach out via email at contact at campfirecultpod.com or leave me a voicemail message at 720-297-8608. You can follow us anywhere on social media at Campfire Cult Pod and online at campfirecultpod.com. And finally, if you don't mind, please rate and review wherever possible. 